although I probably don't need it. Uh, this is my favourite lecture theatre, the biggest lecture theatre on campus. Um, <laughs> So, uh, look, what I usually do uh, every year, I've been teaching in a subject called Community and Social Action, and every year I give a lecture that is about sort of my experience in student activism. I talk about the 99 occupation, I talk about the Gungalia occupation, but when I do that lecture, I'm talking to a group of students who are learning about social action who don't know what it is, and so it's a very different thing than what I'm going to give to you uh, now. Now, I'm going to try it. Actually, I don't... I don't coordinate the unit, so I don't have access to the lecture. If you're those students who are here will know what I mean. Uh, but if I can get uh, an MP3 of it, um, it's something I'll try and make available. Um, but what I wanted to, I guess, do, and before I get into that, I think I just need to position something here. I'm a sociologist by trade. Uh, by academic trade, I should say. Um, and one of the things about being a sociologist, the, the, the awkwardness of the other social sciences, is you're studying the society that you're part of which ends up this uh, Bourdieu calls it a sort of schizophrenic sort of thing. It's, a, it's an awkward sort of thing where you're studying yourself. So I'm always uncomfortable with analysing things that I'm involved in, but I'm inevitably forced to do it. So, and I sort of have this idea too, that when we talk about things like the occupation, um, I don't pretend to be able to represent what happened in totality. Um, we create meaning uh, through our experiences. We, we give meaning to things. And the interesting thing about student activism is we're all together for a couple of years, you know? You, you're there, study hopefully for three years, maybe four if you fail a couple of units, but you know, you're there for this short period of time with this group of people. Directed me in certain ways, and I was talking to Andrew about something this morning where we were just sort of, you know, catching up and, and, and talking about what we're gonna talk about. And we sort of made the comment that, isn't it interesting, none of us were studying teaching in the occupation. We were all doing, you know, politics, social science, or whatever, and so many of us have ended up in teaching roles. Um, and a few of us, like Richard and myself, we've ended up here at UWS still being here. Like, I, I think the occupation probably might be something that ties into that. But anyway, what I, I guess I wanted to do is sort of get beyond the, the, the sort of what happened in the occupation. And I think sort of talk about things that, I guess, are lessons learnt for me from my experience. And it's my experience in the occupation. And I should say, for me, the occupation was um, this moment of success where we had had so much failure before. Uh, one of the things I remember is trying to get a welfare student collective up on campus, even actually talking about the same sort of issues that we were talking about in the occupation six months before and not being able to get students to the meeting. So that's something I might talk about. So for me, the occupation was the successful moment where things came together, where, where things worked, and I learned some lessons or some behaviours, I should say, too, that I've then sort of carried through. So I think what I'll do is I'll, I, I sort of started writing about it and... and but when it asked me, it was going to be just like, you know, a thousand words or something. And I ended up 3,000 words in and I still had about half to go. So I stopped. Uh, and, and I'll go back to it and I'll finish it off and I'll, I'll make it available on the web or something. Um, but I just said, I guess I want to talk about some of the sort of lessons I, I, I got from it and maybe talk about some of the experiences. Um, following on from what Andrew said, um, one of the things, uh, I'll talk about this very quickly, is we were well resourced in the occupation because we had a student association previous year. Uh, we had this lovely block of buildings, uh, sorry, a lovely uh, block of rooms. Uh, we had photocopiers, we had computers, we had phones, we had spaces to meet. It made things a lot easier. Now I know sometimes when activists now look back on those pre-VSU days, and I was involved in student associations when we went through the VSU process and I've seen them change so much. Um, but if you could have those resources now, I doubt whether you would need them more. Like, you don't need computers. You've got phones that do much more things than our 1999 computers ever did. You know, things have changed. But, but that's something I think that, that's worth noting. Having the space, though, was really important. Um, students could come on campus and they could go to the student association and there would always be one or two of us there. We'd always be hanging around. That actually became an important part for our relationship with security because security would always have to come and check on us because we were always there after hours doing something. Not always work. Sometimes just hanging out. Um, that space was really important. That, that's something that, that I, I think, there's other ways around it. Like one of the things, for example, photocopying flyers, like we, you don't have access to that space, but you can find an academic here on campus and use their photocopying after hours when their dean doesn't know about it. The dean's not here, so I can say that. Um, uh, you can talk to uh, the NTU, you can talk to the ACTU, there's other resources out there in regards to that sort of stuff. Um, anyway, I just had to say that because of my first point. One of the things that uh, uh, Andrew definitely touched on, I think was very important, is the occupation was a space of creativity. 
And it was creativity that wasn't directed by a few student reps. Um, it became a space where students felt empowered to do what they wanted. I remember one incident uh, that sticks out to me. Um, I know, Andrew and I definitely weren't there. The whole group of us weren't there, whether we were at meetings or we were doing something else. And while we were away, a group of students said, because every day we'd do a rally, that was part of the gig. Every day we'd do a rally. So after a couple of days, you know, it's who wants to do something. And a group of students said, you know what we should do tomorrow? We should have a funeral for education. And so they decided that's what we're going to do. We came back from the meeting or whatever it was, and they're building a coffin out of paper. Uh, and they're writing, well, there's a guy called Matt, he wanted to dress as a priest. I don't know why, but he wanted to. So we empowered him to dress as a priest, and we wrote this eulogy about um, education and criminology dying, and people did. And the next day we did this parade and this sort of funeral thing around campus. Now, did, did that um, intellectualise the issue? No. Was it awesome fun? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, you can see people engaging uh, in that sort of space. Um, and that's something I think that's become very important. That leads into the fun, but it can be um, uh, another thing. Having that space, every student space, every activist space where there's that freedom, creativity, I always think is stronger. And I think sometimes I've been involved in spaces where uh, it's fantastic, like the occupation, you can do these sort of things. And I've been involved in spaces where you come up with creative ideas and someone shoots them down. That's a sign for me that that's not the space for me but I'm usually out of there pretty quick. So that idea of creativity, I think, is uh, really important. Um, one thing and, and, uh, that I talk about when I talk about uh, the lecture is I think university is a wonderful space to play with social change, to learn things, to experiment. I always say, and this is my vision of university, university should be a safe space to make mistakes and do things, and you're not in the glare of, full glare of society. Like I, there used to be a bar on campus, it's very, it wasn't very important to my activism. Uh, there was a bar here on campus. I used to like the idea that there were students who would come here and this might be the first place they'd get drunk, but it was a safe space because we had good security guards you were sort of looked after. Actually, the bar was a really important aspect because when we talk about the Logger Claims campaign, one of the things that uh, my friend and I were involved in, Dave, is we ran beer trivia down the bar every week, right? And we were doing pretty good, it was pretty popular. We would hand out the Logger Claims forms during trivia and say to people, right, while we're taking a break and doing your sheets, why don't you fill these things out, you know? So there was that sort of, already that sort of aspect going uh, on. Some of the things were about beer, but so there were legitimate issues there as well. Um, and actually going back to that logger claims uh, thing, how important that was, I think one of the things when we talk about um, working here in a university space, like it is a space of creativity, but the students here, I think you need to approach them in a certain way. As I said, I was running this welfare collective, I was trying to have meetings, I was talking about the same sort of issues that ended up coming up in the occupation, I couldn't get anyone to come, I was really struggling with it. And one of the things I think you need to realise with university students, especially probably now more than the past, before I came to university I used to be a plumber and I always noticed that um, leadership on the, on the shop floor and leadership at university was different. Because when you're at university, everyone thinks they're a leader. Like, that's part of the gig, that's part of coming to university. You're already, there's a, there is a, a sense of elitism, you already think you're going somewhere in your life, you're already moving forward. And I always think it's hard to tell leaders, it's hard to tell, to lead leaders by telling them what to do. It doesn't work. What you need to do is in, in, carry, uh, create a space where people are able to embrace the ideas, and that's what the logo claims did. People were able to uh, fill out their issue. Even though it was the issue I was talking about them and, and we'd been talking about them in rallies before, it was their issue when they were sort of in, involved in it, they embraced it, they owned it. I think that's an important aspect at, at university if you want to get people involved. Um, the other thing too is, and on that about a university being a space, as I said, it's a space where you should experiment, we should be free to try things out without being in the full sort of glare of society. It's also a space where we should acknowledge People are coming here 18, 19, even 25, 26 with major life changes. For some people, it's the first time they're getting out from their uh, parents. It's the first time that they're dealing with their sexuality. It's the first time that they're dealing maybe with the religion they were brought up with or embracing a religion or whatever. But I always think our spaces need to take that in mind. There needs to be sort of that um, freedom to understand people are trying things out, that freedom to also um, acknowledge people are going to make mistakes especially in those spaces, and have a space where you're not too cynical, where you don't sort of attack each other, except that we're going to get things wrong. Um, other things uh, I sort of think, um, maybe something that I think we've got better at now than we weren't at the past, 
is inequality and structural, um, or structural inequality should be an issue for everyone. Um, I think back in the day, I remember um, the student union had, a, had a fought a battle for, uh, the women's collective had fought a battle for a women's room on campus. Um, and the student union had agreed and said, yeah, yeah, cool, and, and, and gave that space. And I remember seeing so many uh, members of the women collective, women's collective having to argue with men and sometimes other women why there needed to be a, a, a women's room. And I could see them arguing and arguing and arguing. And then after like the hundredth time they've had the argument, just telling people to fuck off. Right? Which is totally understandable after you've had that argument. I used to always think that that's something that um, we need to, uh, people, and, and the idea of privilege has obviously become more impressed. We need to position ourselves in certain ways. Now, this happened for me and Dave when we did the Gulangali occupation because we had been approached by Indigenous students, we had worked with Indigenous students, and they said they wanted to occupy. And we had this issue well, we're not identifying as Indigenous people. What are we going to do? And so we had to position ourselves in that structure. And we said to the students, all right, here's the gig. We will be your resource, we will help you, we will we'll be directed by you, but we're not going to take, we're not, not going to have votes. And we're not going to speak on issues unless you ask us, like we position ourselves in that way. I think that's something, as all of us now acknowledging what privileges we do in our lives, being able to position ourselves in a way that just because you're in a privileged position doesn't mean you get a get out of jail free card, that you don't have to do any work. But it's about positioning yourself in the way that you do the work without trying to take the leadership, which I, I think is something that we've got better at over time. A um, couple of other things, just thinking off the top of my head. Um, uh, actually, I'll talk about that. Um, one thing I would say, after the occupation, there was, because the occupation was huge, you know, there was at one stage like 100 students on campus, it was this gigantic. We never had a campaign that was as big as that again. Like, we never had one that embraced so many people. And I think what happened afterwards, because obviously we loved that. It was such a wonderful space and we wanted to get back to it. And if I look at many of our campaigns afterwards, I could see we took elements from that. Um, but what we had to do is work with what you've got. So we had a situation, I remember, just to tell a little couple of, couple of stories about a couple of other actions that happened to illustrate that. Um, we had uh, an issue, I think it was about 2000, at the end of November, the university had leaked out, like sometimes they do in the press when they're thinking about an idea, that they were considering introducing upfront fees as a separate uh, stream at UWS. So more or less students could buy their way into university. Now we heard about this, but this was like end of November, beginning of December, there were no students around. There was like six or seven of us in the office. And we thought, well, what are we gonna do? So what we decided to do, uh, it was David Wilcox who came up with this idea, we're going to uh, go to the Chancellery and see you know, the university management and we're going to sing them Christmas carols. That's the gig, that's what we'll do, right? And so Day's work and rewriting all these songs about, you know, but now they're about you know, student uh, debt and you know, student inequity and, and all these things. And so we went there, uh, one activist I remember, uh, she wrapped up all these empty boxes because she had an idea of what she was going to do, right? Wrapped up the week. So we went to the Chancery and we came in and we we're in Christmas hats and stuff, like we looked silly. But when we walked in, I could see them thinking, oh shit, this is the people that occupied Bankstown. And they started shutting down the Chancery, right? Locking doors and, you know, people were coming down and, and the, whoa, 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 what, what do you guys want? Uh, we just want to sing for you. Okay, and then we're singing the songs and, you know, and, and I think some of us are feeling a bit silly, some of us are having a good time, some of us have got great voices, right? And we're, having, we're singing at them. Um, and then at the end, I remember Rhonda Hawkins had come down and, and, and we said, you know, we're doing this because obviously we're concerned that you, you're thinking about upfront fees. We saw the report, like, we really don't think you should do it. You know, it's about student poverty. I remember the activist then said to Rhonda, oh, and here's some presents. And Rhonda obviously didn't click and went, oh, thank you. And she said, oh, and they're empty because we're poor. And you could just see Rhonda's face <laughs> just twist like it just she got caught out like it was this sort of uh, moment um, and then we left and then we got back and we got back and there was a fax from the university saying that they were categorically ruling out our front fees right so just with a handful of a six or seven we got the results so sometimes it's about using what you got um, one other one I'll quickly do and I've just got to tell you this because I feel obliged any time I talk to UWS students I need to remind them about this uh, many years ago right before actually many of us were here um, the university got a, a load of books from Sydney Uni, a donation, right? Um, now, you can't read those books because the management now, not the management that's in place now or even the management that just left, like a management previous that, they took the books and they buried them at Campbelltown, right? 
So there's always been this rumour at UWS about these buried books. And at one stage, when we talk about leverage or we talk about power, we threatened the university because we had said, like, we have radicalised Bankstown. If you don't give us what we want, we're off to Campbelltown next, OK? And the Campbelltown kids are really excited, the Student Association there, because they're like, oh, yeah, and we could have an occupation too. Da, da. So we had a rally which was called Dig Up the Books, right? I remember I went and bought a brand new shovel. I remember walking on campus with this lovely green shovel and security guards making fun of me. Clearly, I'd never used this shovel before. We had this rally and we walked all the way over to um, where the books were meant to be buried. I don't know if they were buried there. None of us were there when this happened under a car park. The ground was very hard, OK? So we said, we can't bear, I'll dig up these books. Let's go to... Now, I don't know if anyone's from Campbelltown here or if you've... Has anyone been to Campbelltown? Right? Have you heard about the ceremonial lawn? You haven't. I'm going to tell you why you haven't. So there was a ceremonial lawn there at Campbelltown that had won awards from gardening clubs and whatever, and in fact students weren't allowed to walk on it at certain times of the year. So we went to the ceremonial lawn and we couldn't dig up the book. Can you see where I'm going? So we dug up the ceremonial lawn, right? And we buried the vice chancellor's, um, the, this is the shape of the future, the book that she had wrote about how the, we, we buried that and ha ha, you know, it was a great rally, right? Awesome time. Uh, we left. And then the Campbelltown Student Association got a call saying, uh, we can't believe that you guys dug up the, the lawn. Like, they had just done a deal to get some new officers. And they said to the, the Campbelltown Student Association, um, we can't believe you've done that. Uh, and they said, oh, it, it, we, we can't tell you who done it. Because they're proud of their rally, right? Oh, yeah, well, ha, <laughs> ha, you know. They said, well, you're not getting your spaces until you uh, tell us who dug up the, the lawn. And they said, John McGuire did it. John McGuire did it, like straight away. Uh, and I was on the board of trustees and the university couldn't do shit. Uh, but that was the sort of stuff that we had, the sort of stuff that was um, that fun, entertaining sort of level. You know, it was fun to do, but it was one of those things where sometimes when we catch up with people, we remember, we talk about it. And even the students who weren't part of it, who saw it and witnessed it, would then think about it later on. And I always think that's one of the aspects that when you're doing stuff on campus, you've got to have that element of fun. Not just so you guys have fun with it, but other students are attracted to that sort of stuff. Like we do live in a world where people are trying to create um, life themselves. People are trying to create excitement. That's something I think that whenever you do activism, there's got to be an element of it. Um, anyway, I've talked far too long, so maybe I should stop. Thank you.